Operation Abolition. This is what the communists call their current drive to destroy the House Committee on Un-American Activities, weaken the Federal Bureau of Investigation, to discredit its great director, J. Edgar Hoover, and to render sterile the security laws of our government. The Communist Party has given top priority to Operation Abolition and has assigned agents trained in propaganda and agitation to this project. This pamphlet is a report by J. Edgar Hoover illustrating the communist strategy and tactics in the rioting which occurred during hearings of the House Committee on Un-American Activities in San Francisco, California on May 12th through 14th, 1960. This film, based on the FBI director's report, is the story of those riots. The successful communist exploitation and manipulation of youth and student groups throughout the world today are a major challenge which free world forces must meet and defeat. Recent world events clearly reveal that world communism has launched a massive campaign to capture and maneuver youth and student groups. In the United States, the Communist Party is jubilant about success it has had recently in developing and exploiting youth and student groups. It is vitally important to set the record straight on the extent to which communists were responsible for the disgraceful and riotous conditions which prevailed during the House Committee on Un-American Activities hearings. It is vitally important that not only the students involved in that incident, but also students throughout the nation whom communists hope to exploit in similar situations, recognize the communist tactics which resulted in what experienced West Coast observers familiar with communist strategy and tactics have termed the most successful communist coup to occur in the San Francisco area in 25 years. This is City Hall in San Francisco, the site of hearings held by the House Committee on Un-American Activities in May of 1960. This is the chosen battlefield of the Communist Party's most organized and violent attack on the committee since the launching of the Operation Abolition Campaign on September 20th, 1957. Congressman Francis Walter, chairman of the full committee, designated Congressman Edwin E. Willis of Louisiana as chairman of a subcommittee charged with the investigation of Communist Party activities in the Northern California area. In an interview with the press, Congressman Willis explains more fully the reasons for the hearings. What we are here to do is to gather information, as we are ordered to, to do, by an act of Congress with respect to the general operation of the communist conspiracy, wherever it may lead. Uh, it's a mandate that law has been on the books for probably over 20 years. We receive our appropriations and are ordered every year to maintain this general surveillance uh, of the communist operations with the view of amending, improving, correcting uh, laws having to do with our internal security, the Internal Security Act of 1950, Foreign Agents Registration Act, the Smith Act, uh, and so on. This is part and parcel of our general studies of the machinations of the communist conspiracy. The communist apparatus activated its trained agitators and propagandists in the San Francisco Bay Area months before the scheduled hearings were to begin. The first objective of the party was to fill the scene of the hearings with demonstrators. The second was to incite them to action through the use of mob psychology. One of the recipients of a subpoena was Douglas Wachter, an 18-year-old sophomore at the University of California. Wachter, incidentally, had attended the 17th National Convention of the Communist Party in December 1959 as an official delegate from Northern California. Party officials decided to build a major part of their plan of attack around Wachter. Immediately after receiving a subpoena, Wachter proceeded to the University of California campus to organize student demonstrators. The carefully organized protest campaign was climaxed with a student directive published just prior to the hearings on the front page of the official University of California student newspaper, The Daily Californian. The directive reads as follows. The Student Committee for Civil Liberties plans to picket the hearings today it has issued a call for students to attend the rally and hearings and suggests that people laugh out loud in the hearings when things get ridiculous. Among the communist leaders who had an active part in the San Francisco abolition campaign and the protest demonstrations was Harry Bridges, the leader of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union, whom you see here being escorted out of City Hall by police officials 
moments after the rioting inside had subsided. Archie Brown, another longshoreman, played a major role in inciting the demonstrations against the committee. He is identified as the number two man in the California Communist Party and admittedly has been a party member for some 20 years. In the course of the three days of the hearings, Archie Brown had to be ejected from the hearing room on three separate occasions. He was active in distributing propaganda pamphlets outside the city hall building. Archie Brown had been subpoenaed by the committee as a witness. One of the top communist agents assigned to Operation Abolition is Frank Wilkinson, recently convicted for contempt of Congress for refusal to answer questions concerning his Communist Party membership and activities. Frank Wilkinson's job for the Communist Party consists of one prime duty, to incite resistance and trouble for the House Committee on Un-American Activities in any given location where the committee is to conduct hearings. Frank Wilkinson was interviewed by newsmen shortly after he had been agitating among the student demonstrators. Well, have you had anything to do with the demonstrations in front of the city hall today? No, I've just been an observer of those. I understood uh, you had said you were organizing protests against the committee. Yes, uh, one of the things that our committee does and that I do for our committee is to come to each community when the committee issues its subpoena to assist the subpoenaed persons and others in the community who are not familiar with the kind of unconstitutional behavior that this committee carries on to assist that community and to assist those subpoenees in their own self-defense. In the committee hearings today, you were called an international communist agent. Are you a communist? <laughs> That's a very flattering remark. I've been frequently called a a uh, hardcore communist, a local communist by Mr. Ahrens, but never an international communist. As far as the basic question is concerned, until the Supreme Court uh, has answered the fundamental constitutional question, which is now pending in my case, which is one of the 36 First Amendment test cases of this committee, until they have resolved this matter and declared these kind of questions under compulsion, to be illegal and unconstitutional. Uh, I refuse to answer the questions away from the committee just as I refuse to answer them directly to the, to the committee when I've been called. Another top communist agitator, also subpoenaed as a witness, was Merle Brodsky, whom you see here participating in the chanting and singing demonstrations immediately outside the hearing room. Merle Brodsky was ejected from the hearing room on two separate occasions for leading demonstrations while the committee was receiving testimony. The opening day of the hearings, Thursday, May 12th, finds City Hall almost completely surrounded by picketers protesting the committee's appearance. Inside the building, the committee has reserved the largest hearing room in the city with a seating capacity of over 400 to accommodate an anticipated crowd. Officials admit spectators to the room's capacity while others are asked to remain outside until vacancies occur. As soon as the hearings began, party members began playing their predetermined roles the belligerent and insulting behavior of some of the 36 uncooperative witnesses was so aggravating, it became necessary to order their forcible removal from the hearing room to preserve order and decorum. Archie Brown and Merle Brodsky, acting according to plan, were sullen and contemptuous. Douglas Wachter is called to the stand and interrogated by staff director Richard Ahrens. He is asked about his Communist Party membership and his activities as a communist in various phases of college life. I respectfully object to the question on the same grounds. Any question as to my political beef, beliefs, association statements deprive me of the right of free speech, press, assembly, and petition. The House on American Activities Committee serves no real legislative or constitutional purpose. It punishes individuals and you're reading from a prayer sheet. You're reading from a prepared statement. That's all right. Let him ask the question. Uh, continue reading it, please. 
It punishes individuals and groups for their politi political ideas and associations through public exposure well, now, and condemnation. Now, I'm sorry. Are you all refusing to answer on the basis of the First Amendment? Is that correct? I have, re I, I have objected to the question. It punishes individuals and groups for their political ideas and associations through public exposure and condemnation, often resulting in economic sanction. I cannot cooperate with the committee in answering any such questions. I feel I have an obligation as a, as a citizen of this country to preserve the Constitution, and I do not feel I can do so in good conscience by allow, allowing the House and American Activities Committee to inquire into my beliefs or associations. Mr. Wachter has not at this point invoked provisions against self-incrimination of the Fifth Amendment. He is ordered and directed to answer a question concerning his Communist Party membership. I decline to answer that question on the grounds previously stated, and I also respectfully refuse to answer that question on the constitutional grounds that I cannot be forced to bear witness against myself. During the noon luncheon recess, a protest rally in Union Square attracts nearly a thousand students and spectators. They listen intently as two San Francisco assemblymen and a prominent clergyman unleash bitter attacks against the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The rally is designed to incite further resentment against the committee and to recruit more volunteers for action. The rally accomplishes its major objectives, for, during the afternoon session, hundreds of additional students crowd into the corridors of City Hall, attempting to gain entry to the already overcrowded hearing room. Students left outside the room step up their chanting and singing, turning the hallways of City Hall into complete chaos. Officials are unable to maintain order. After the luncheon recess, Brown and Brodsky went into action again. Shortly before the afternoon session was to begin, they grabbed a microphone at the front of the hearing room and demanded that all spectators outside be admitted. Their sympathizers shouted similar demands. After refusing to obey orders to be seated, Brown, Brodsky, and several others were forcibly removed, each resisting violently. From left to right, you see Communist Party members Ralph Izzard, Archie Brown, Salutarian Sweet, and Saul Wachter, all especially trained in agitation and incitement to riot.
freighter. Open the doors. Here comes the goose squad. This is Americanism. Watch this Americanism in action. Oh, watch this Americanism in action. Watch this Americanism. No, 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 no. no. Upon request of Chairman Willis, policemen removed the resisting demonstrators from the hearing room. First, Archie Brown. Then, Ralph Izzard. Saul Wachter. Morris Graham. Merle Brodsky. Juanita Wheeler. And finally, Sally Atarian Sweet. As a result of mushrooming interest generated by the activities of the first day, the crowd on the second day was much larger. A particularly noticeable aspect of the increase was the presence of additional party members and former party members. Friday, May 13th. Loudspeakers are set up across the street from City Hall in an attempt to alleviate the crowds trying to gain entrance to the hearing room. Nevertheless, hundreds of students, longshoremen and spectators, crowd into the City Hall building as picketers continue to demonstrate outside. As was the case on Thursday, several professional communist agitators and student leaders direct the activity of those waiting in the hallways. Chants and songs get louder, and defiance to police attempts to maintain order becomes more universal. Students enthusiastically join in on the refrains to the songs Abolish the Committee, We Shall Not Be Moved, lyrics to which are lifted from the old Communist People's Songbook. Demonstrations in the hallways of City Hall become so loud that the municipal judges in their chambers on the third floor are unable to continue court procedures. During the morning, the judges give orders to the sheriff and police officials to remove the demonstrators from City Hall immediately. As pamphlets continue to be distributed among the demonstrators, police officials once again warn the students and agitators involved that they must be quiet or the orders of the judges will be enforced. The police warnings are met with jeers and boos and renewed chanting and renewed singing. An officer warned that fire hoses would have to be used if the crowd did not disperse. But the crowd, instigated by communists who had maneuvered themselves into strategic positions, became more unruly. One of the demonstrators provided the spark that touched off the flame of violence. Leaping a barricade that had been erected, he grabbed an officer's nightstick and began beating the officer over the head. The mob surged forward as if to storm the doors and a police inspector ordered the fire hose turned on. At this point, leaders of the group give orders to resist police enforcement. The crowd, now in open defiance of law and order, begins singing once again, we shall not be moved. Riot squad police reinforcements arrive on the scene and are met by boos and jeers from the rioters. The communist agitators give new orders now to the students to sit down with their backs to the fire hoses and put their hands in their pockets after interlocking arms in what is described later by student newspapers as non-violent resistance. Police enforcing judicial orders to remove the demonstrators from the building take the defiant students one by one by the feet and slide them down the wetted marble stairs of City Hall. On several occasions, the pattern of so-called non-violent resistance is broken openly by defiant students. Those who had defied the law are taken to waiting police wagons and are hurried off to police headquarters where they are booked on counts of disturbing the peace, inciting a riot, and resisting arrest. The communist and pro-communist press, of course, 
charge police brutality. Their press accounts of the rioting describe repeated incidents of policemen cruelly beating innocent students. The innocent, peaceful students, it is stated in these communist press accounts, were physically hurled down two stories of stairs, toppling head over heel, and landed unconscious at the bottom where they were picked up and thrown into the paddy wagons. These films, taken by newsmen on the scene, show a clear example of the lack of respect for truth, which is common practice within the communist propaganda press. The Communist Party emerges from the riots with only a handful of its party members arrested and none injured. Four students suffer minor injuries, eight policemen are injured to the point where they require hospitalization. officers were seriously hurt, two suffering heart attacks, and three are treated for deep cuts. One of the communist professional agitators arrested is Vernon Bown, who was in 1954 among the notorious Louisville Seven, charged at that time with sedition, destruction of property, conspiring to destroy property to achieve a political end, and contempt of court. Douglas Walker, the 19-year-old student leader, was another Communist Party member who was arrested. At the police station, the rebellious students appear to have lost a little bit of their blatant enthusiasm and defiance, for without the psychological stimulus of mass chanting and singing, the individual students seem somewhat conscious and ashamed of what they have done. No longer is there the air of defiance. The organized resistance has been changed into individual confusion. These young people have been duped into openly resisting and defying law enforcement, duped by a handful of communist agitators. You have seen two types of communist-inspired violence, one taking the form of mass challenges of authority and defiance of law and order inside a congressional hearing room, the other coming in the form of open rioting and physical resistance to law enforcement. A third type of communist tactic, common in the Operation Abolition campaign, is defiance by individual witnesses and their attorneys to the committee itself. One such witness is William Mandel, an identified agent of the Communist Party, who is employed as a radio and television news commentator in the San Francisco Bay Area. William Mandel is a top communist propagandist, serving the party in the underground areas as an instructor in communist training schools and operating for the party in public circles posing as a respected newsman. He displays his bitter defiance of the committee in answer to questions concerning his Communist Party membership and activities. Do you think that I am going to cooperate with this collection of Judases, of men who sit there in violation of the United States Constitution? If you think I will cooperate with you in any way, you are insane. 
When asked about his role as a communist in lecturing before the communist-conceived California Labor School in San Francisco, William Mandel replies, This question has no purpose on it to harass me. When I was asked this question last in 1943 by the late Joe McCarthy, and let me say that I am honored when people come up to me on the streets, perhaps I don't deserve this honor, and say, you're the man who killed Joe McCarthy because I happened to appear on the first day of the book burning hearing, and I did my best to conduct myself in the manner which I'm conducting myself today. If there were any such evidence against me under any law, the proper authorities could move against me. This body is improperly constituted. It is a kangaroo court. It does not have my respect. It has my utmost contempt. And I am not going to answer that question, sir. This, then, is the pattern employed by the communists their dupes and sympathizers in Operation Abolition. The communists demonstrated in San Francisco just how powerful a weapon communist infiltration is. They revealed how it is possible for only a few communist agitators using mob psychology to turn peaceful demonstrations into riots. Their success there must serve as a warning that their infiltration efforts aimed not only at the youth and student groups, but also at our labor unions, churches, professional groups, artists, newspapers, government, and the like, can create chaos and shatter our internal security. Looking at the riots and chaos communists have created in other countries, many Americans point to the strength of our nation and say, it can't happen here. The communist success in San Francisco in May of 1960 proves that it can happen here.